England, 1888. Hundreds of large-scale manufacturing plants had opened during this period of tremendous industrial growth. And many women served as unskilled laborers, working in terrible conditions for very little money. The trade unions of the day weren't interested in the plight of these unskilled workers. Conditions at the Bryant and May Match Factory were particularly appalling, where women worked as many as 14 hours a day, suffering from exposure to toxic chemicals. But as miserable as many of them were, none openly protested. Then, one day, an unassuming woman in proper dress with swept back hair walked in. Her name was Annie Besant. In Victorian England, she was known as Red Annie. I mean, she was there on the barricades. She was passionate for the rights of women. She was passionate about labor conditions. She was passionate about child labor. Besant's involvement with the Match Girls produced a three-week strike that forever changed the labor movement in England. Never before had unskilled workers organized a strike against management. For many, this success would have marked a pinnacle of their career. For Annie Besant, it was just one step in a lifelong quest that took her from the factory floor to the temples of India and into the depths of religious mysticism. Her deepest convictions related to uh, making a difference in the world. She felt that it was her highest calling to be of service to humanity. She always was someone who carved her own course and very much created her own destiny. Her sense of compassion was strong. During her long career as an activist, social reformer, and religious nonconformist, Annie Besant sacrificed her family, risked her reputation, and even lost her freedom. She was motivated by a desire for spiritual fulfillment, a quest that compelled her to reinvent herself in both rewarding and surprising ways. Life for middle-class Victorian women in the late 1800s was bound by rigid formality and limited possibility. For the young Annie Wood, those constraints felt like a straitjacket. She'd had a hard time accepting the status quo even as a girl. And Annie had grown into a self-reliant and independent young woman. In that age, girls were trained to be pleasing, learn to play the piano, but not too well, speak French, but not philosophically, uh, do a little bit of painting, just so that they were pleasing to the men around them. They could uh, enhance their homes with social graces. Well, Besson's education was not that at all. Reading on her own in a friend's library, Annie was a self-made intellectual. She loved the classics and history, and she was particularly drawn to theology and religious ritual. She saw religion as a path to help end the world's suffering. She could be a minister herself, that was not allowed for women. And so she took uh, then the best choice she could, which was a disastrous choice, she married a clergyman. The Reverend Frank Besant, seven years her senior, was as methodical and austere as his new bride was impulsive and exuberant. Within the first week of the marriage, it was clear as a disaster. She had thought it'd be a great avenue to serve God. She quickly found that it was an avenue to serve tea, which is not what she wanted. I don't think her husband understood her intellectual interests at all. I can imagine him coming home in the afternoon and finding Annie Besant that she's been reading all day and she hasn't done the dishes or cleaned the house and he's angry, you know, why aren't you being a proper wife? In fact, Frank Besant was a bad-tempered man. Frustrated with his strong-willed wife, he at times struck her, even while she was pregnant. For four years, Annie struggled against depression and tried to be a proper wife and mother, but a family illness served as a turning point and brought about a crisis of faith. Her baby daughter, Mabel, came down with whooping cough, a deadly illness. And all she could do is hold the baby. She starts asking herself the question, well, why would a God, the Christian God, who is all-powerful, uh, who is all-loving and all-good, why would a God like that let a little baby suffer like this? And uh, fortunately, her daughter got well. 
but it really started her theological questioning. The more Besant examined church dogma, the greater her doubts became. For Besant, the church she had so loved as a young girl now seemed only a source of hypocrisy, an empty ritual. She had lost her faith. I do not believe in God. My mind finds no grounds on which to build up a reasonable faith. My conscience rebels against the injustice, the cruelty, the inequality which surround me on every side. She felt that she was no longer a Christian. She could not take communion. Now, of course, her husband was an Anglican priest. She's sitting there on the front row as a clergyman's wife. Then, time for communion, and she dramatically stands up and walks out and embarrasses him, and um, he then gives her an ultimatum and says, you conform or you leave. For a woman to abandon her husband in Victorian England was unthinkable. But despite the difficulties this choice presented, Besant's strong convictions left her with no alternative. At that period, a, a woman belonged to her husband, <laughs> and uh, she had no property of her own, could, could own no property of her own, even. In 1873, at the age of 26, Annie Besant moved to London and left her son Digby with her husband. Everything was arranged. I found myself guardian of my little daughter and possessor of a small monthly income sufficient for respectable starvation. I think of all the things she did, this is the point at which she showed her greatest courage. This is what now demarcates her from most Victorian women, some of whom were in unhappy marriages, who simply suffered and found other avenues or managed to cope. Besant was not one to cope, she was one to rebel. London in the late 19th century had become a mecca for those, like Annie Besant, who rejected the status quo. They condemned materialism, they opposed the expanding British colonial empire, and they supported women's rights. They were the radicals and intellectuals of their day, and it didn't take long for Besant to find her place among them. Educated and eloquent, Besant quickly became a popular lecturer and writer. Here you have a woman who, horror of horrors, is an atheist, but also speaking in public. People used to throw things at her in her lectures. Many women are driven into bitterness because their ambition is thwarted at every step. In their eager longing for a fuller life, they are forced back and crushed. She found herself intoxicated by the excitement of standing before a crowd. Everyone, even people who later couldn't stand her, always acknowledged that her oratory was quite extraordinary. She could weave a spell over an audience. And one could make a living at that in late Victorian England. Unlike many other reformers of the day, Besant did not curb her tactics to appeal to so-called decent society. Instead, she took a step in the opposite direction. She spoke out on the most taboo subject of all, birth control. In Victorian England in the 1870s, it was uh, against the law to speak or publish anything related to birth control. It was considered obscene. Besant knew full well how inflammatory the subject was. She'd been warned that she was risking both arrest and the custody of her daughter Mabel. But she decided that drawing attention to this issue was worth the risk. In 1877, Besant and a colleague distributed a booklet promoting female contraception. In it, they argued that with more mouths to feed, the poor were less likely to improve their standard of living. We think it more moral to prevent conception of children than after they are born to murder them by want of food, air, and clothing. She avoided a prison sentence, but Besant's extremist colleagues felt that she had gone too far. This confirmed in the minds of many that Besant was someone you don't want to be associated with, that uh, she is too radical, but also too immoral. Besant's estranged husband agreed. He used the pamphlet as evidence that Besant was an unfit mother who promoted what was termed indecent and obscene material. After a highly publicized custody hearing, the court ruled in her husband's favor. Besant now resigned herself to the loss of both of her young children. 
Ironically, in an attempt to aid poor families, she had lost her own. <laughs> 